colonel. I'm trying to sneak around, but I'm dummy thick, and the clap of my ass cheeks keeps alerting the guards. Okay. 22nd August 2019. I watched an eccentric British man dancing with a corpse. And I thought, hey, I want to do that too. A few clicks and several mods later, we were engaged in various recreational activities. Oh, Voldemort, you have such a lovely nose. Oh, Dumbledore, take me. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. Blade and Sorcery is a fantastic game. At the time, it was the VR game up there with the big three. But for the longest time, it was associated with two of the dandest phrases that would make any VR enjoyer scream. Physics sandbox. Early access. <laughs> so when Blade and Sorcery's official 1.0 release called The End dropped, I dropkicked my boss and quit my job just so that I could play. And by god, it is glorious. A full new campaign, new in-game lore and language that you can translate yourself, the linguists on reddit are frothing at the mouth, a new character with Two more strikes and you're out of here. 78 whole new skills, 76 weapons in total, a giant new boss, new maps with 16 times the detail. The old non-functioning cup holder is now a new shiny functioning cup holder that also gives you skills. For my first playthrough, I went with the body core build which meant that I was literally too strong and too stupid to die. <gasps> she's throwing hands! Ah! Officer, I swear, it's not what it looks like. She's just choking. Choking on these n- My gains were so big that I couldn't help ripping people in half. RIP AND TAP! RIP AND TAP! RIP AND TAP! Armed with an assortment of weapons, I fought my way through the Dalgarian ruins. Domain expansion, unlimited cock works. That's right, fear my mighty cock. Good job, little one. I was literally unstoppable. God damn. And I have to address the golem in the room. Engaging in fisticuffs with a golem four times your height is amazing. Getting tossed around while hanging onto Hector is exhilarating. I'm not sure if this feeling of visual was intentional, but I don't think it's something that I've ever experienced in VR before. Somebody please, please use this and create a Monster Hunter or Dragon's Dogma VR game. I beg you, I will give you my firstborn child. Oh, this is... Oh, oh. oh what the fuck? Oh, 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 oh. What the fuck up this is insane? Holy shit. But is Blade and Sorcery so important just because they threw in some pages of lore and added shiny new progression? No, of course not. In fact, the devs have stated that Blade and Sorcery was intended to be an immersive full physics simulator. The rest is incidental. What I think makes Crystal Hunt so important is that Warp Frog took six years of cooking in a physics sandbox, packaged it into a big ass update and campaign, and finally said, here's how you really play the game. Now I could be talking out of my ass and maybe warp frog smoke crack all day to get here. But let me explain. Blade and Sorcery came out on Steam in 2018. It's not the first VR video game, but in my mind it's one of the OG headline VR games of our generation. VR gaming has grown so much in the past 6 years, but we are still in the wild west of VR gaming. In my mind, Half-Life Alyx still represents the gold standard for a VR experience. It has great VR elements, good story, great progression, and polish arguably to a degree greater than what you would expect in most flat screen video games. I'm looking at you, Todd. It just works. To my knowledge, there have been many early access VR games which are basically just assets and features cobbled together for players to occupy themselves for a few hours. And that's fine. Not every game needs to bring about industrial revolution. Not every developer has pockets as deep as Valve. And an incomplete game should never be marketed as a finished product. I'm looking at you, Todd. 
All of this just works. But when the market is saturated with early access titles that appear to have no angle inside, the future of VR gaming just doesn't look all that promising. Now I've always felt that Blade and Sorcery was peak VR gaming, because it was designed like a VR game. But what do I mean? Well, in one of their patches, Warpfrog mentioned that they want to avoid gamey abstraction. Now those are big boy words, and Google tells me that it's a method or model that developers use to curate the player's interaction and experience in the game. Now because my brain is smooth, I have no idea what that means. But what I think it means is that instead of flicking through a menu to buy weapons from a shop, Blade and Sorcery makes it such that you have to physically pick up the weapon, drop it in front of the shopkeeper, before you can buy it. In Half-Life Alyx, if you wanted to hack or unlock something, you had this really cool 3D puzzle to solve by directly manipulating the orb with both hands. Now I could be totally wrong, and if I am, it's because I'm chronically stupid. But moving on. A while back, I stumbled onto a video by Clustered Beaks on how Blade and Sorcery is actually a climbing game. It's a great video, please do watch it. Right, I watched the whole video, had my mind blown, and then proceeded to never climb anything in Blade and Sorcery for the rest of my life. Well, for the rest of my life until now. Because it wasn't until Warp Frog sat me down, pointed at a wall, and said, it's not that blue crystal, before I was really able to appreciate the features available to us. Throughout the campaign, I had to scale boots and rocks to get from place to place. I had to climb onto Hector and hang on for dear life. If I wanted to get somewhere, I could climb or swim my way there. During one of my runs, I fell into a river, and I sure as hell wasn't going to reset my run and waste all of my progress. So I turned around, stared stupidity in the face, and climbed back up through sheer power of will. And ever since then, I've just been climbing everything. And that's just one aspect of the game. Where you hold your weapons affect its heft and weight and how you use it. When you open doors, you have to interact with it in a certain way. Some skills are activated by physical actions. I'm referring to the body skills mostly, and even leveling up is its own unique interaction. Some of these things are new, but some of them have also been in the game for quite some time. I've just never been able to appreciate them. I know this is kind of like a no shit Captain Obvious kind of point, but being told how to play a game and having an objective to work towards drastically changes the experience of the game. And I don't think I could have appreciated it as much as I do now if I was still flailing around when Blade and Sorcery was still in an early access sandbox. And to be fair, early access doesn't always equal bad. As far as physics sandboxes go, games like Bone Lab, which was fully released and developed to push or show off the limits of VR, but for all of its technical complexity, it only just felt like a showcase. Despite the hype, most people just moved on after messing around for a while. There was a campaign there too, but it kind of felt like I was going through the motion just to get from one destination to the next. Bone Lab gave us an amazing physics engine, and if their objective was to push the Mero SDK to the modders and to the public, then they've succeeded completely. And since then, there were a few minor patches here and there, but nothing substantial. And like many others, I moved on. On the other hand, I feel far more interested in endeavors like Project TX, where you have a single developer showing off his VR innovations in his own VR sandbox with regular video updates. For Blade and Sorcery, every Blade and Sorcery update brought something new to the table. Something that made me feel that they were working towards something greater. Update 5 introduced dismemberment, Update 8 revamped Sorcery completely, and Update 12 taught us that swimming floats were for pussies. Through updates 1 to 12, you can see how Warp Frog was building this game up to a version that finally met their expectations. Which leads me to my next point, managing expectations. In a time where skepticism becomes a state of being, because video game corporations overpromise and underdeliver, it's comforting to have a talented and dedicated team that underpromises and overdelivers, where every update they release is a banger. I'm not saying that Blade and Sorcery is a masterpiece, but they've earned my confidence. And I'd like to think that the regular updates and transparency with the community all contributed to the longevity of the game and a thriving modding community. It wasn't uncommon to receive a humorous update from the team about the latest shenanigans and bugs breaking the game. But I feel that early access games are a different creature altogether. I find myself replaying early access titles far more than the other fully released games that I own. Maybe there's something wrong with me, but 
I am far more excited for each update for an early access game. It's a little bit like how I would re-download MapleStory every time a new character was released. Shout out to all the pre-Big Bang Maplers out there. And I think it's because early access games have that potential to grow, maybe to even overhaul their entire concept with each update. When you buy a fully released AAA game that's trash, you know it's dead. It's not going to change. But when you sell me an early access game, you're selling me a promise that this chunk of rock you've sold me will turn into a 100 carat diamond. And I expect you to keep that promise. And with each update, you have a chance to prove that you're going to keep that promise. If an update doesn't turn out well, that's fine. The community will give you feedback and maybe the next one will be better. But the reality may be that you can't keep slipping or your community will lose faith. And speaking of feedback, if you want to make something good, you're probably going to need feedback. But to get feedback, you're gonna need traffic. But nobody is going to play the game if it isn't somewhat decent to begin with. And therein lies a circular problem. You're going to have to rely on the generosity of people to buy into your promise of an eventually good game. And it's difficult to do that if the game isn't fun to begin with. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer. Right, these are just the rumblings of a madman. But fortunately, as a medieval fantasy fighting game, conceptually, Blade and Sorcery was always going to be fun. It doesn't help the stereotype that humanity always chooses violence, but sometimes, why use word when fists do job good? And feedback and ideas can come in many forms. I like to think that maybe Warp Frog took some inspiration from the creativity and wild ideas that came from the modding community, because some of the mods are genuinely insane and perfectly capture how interactivity in VR games should be. Some mods like the Shatterblade and Dire Wand work differently based on the different gestures you give. And if I'm not wrong, the creator of those mods is also a part of the team working on Blade and Sorcery? So I presume that there's some transfer of information and ideas there. I think? But I don't know if this is the case, this is just pure speculation on my part. Early access and physics sandbox are terrifying words and rightly so in this era of video games, but they are also representative of unbridled potential. It's a tough road and not every developer has a million dollar budget or idea from the get-go. So to every hopeful developer labouring on their dream project, hang in there. It's heartening to see a project grow and eventually leave early access to such positive reception. I feel like a proud father watching his child walk down the aisle I know that Blade and Sorcery isn't the only successful game to have left early access, but it is the one that I've been keeping track of for the longest time. And I'd like to think that Blade and Sorcery stands as a shining beacon in the VR gaming sphere, inspiring others to really capitalize on the things that make VR special. Uh, look, at, at this point I'm just rambling, but finally experiencing Blade and Sorcery the way it was intended feels like the end of an era. And I really just wanted to talk about how I felt even though I didn't know how to verbalize it. I know the game and Warp Frog isn't going to end here, but the game grew together with VR. And looking at the credits, you can see each and every step taken to get to where we are today. And now that Blade and Sorcery 1.0 is finally out, I think that the end is really only just the beginning.